Welcome to Law & Crime Daily. I'm Anjanette Levy in for Brian Buckmeyer, and with me as always is co-host Terry Austin. We begin tonight with the trial of a former police captain accused of murder in a movie theater. A jury of six people reaches a verdict after only three hours of deliberation. Now, this case, you'll recall, dates all the way back to 2014 when the defendant, Curtis Reeves, shot and killed Chad Olson at a Pasco County, Florida movie theater. Reeves's defense team says Olson was on his cell phone during movie theater previews. After Reeves reported Olson to management, a fight broke out. Reeves says Olson threw a cell phone at him and that he feared for his life. On the stand, he testified it was the, quote, end of the line for me, saying Olson was coming at him with rage. That's when Reeves shot Olson, claiming it was self-defense. Since the 2014 shooting and a failed Stand Your Ground hearing in 2017, Reeves has been on house arrest. At about 9 p.m. last Friday night, the jury returned a surprising verdict. State of Florida versus Curtis Judson Reeves, count one, murder in the second degree. Verdict, we the jury finds as follows. The defendant is not guilty. Count two, aggravated battery, Verdict. We, the jury, find as follows. The defendant is not guilty. And we're joined by co-host Terry Austin, of course, and legal analyst Mike Korobonix, legal analyst for Law and Crime Network, of course. Mike, I'll start with you on this one. A lot of people thought this was going to be a guilty verdict. What do you think led to an acquittal on both counts? A lot of people were very surprised by this. Well, I'm one of those a lot of people, to be quite frank with you in this matter. I, I was very shocked by the uh, verdict in this matter. But when you review it and look at it, I think there were certain things that played to the defense's favor in this matter, mainly that he didn't really react immediately. He actually went to the management of the movie theater and reported what was going wrong. Then he had another confrontation. And I think that by putting him on the stand, which I usually hardly ever agree with, but here we had a former police chief who was trained how to testify. And I think when they put on to the facts that he had warned him not to, uh, to put his phone, to put the phone away and then went and reported it and then was confronted that at that point with his age, he felt he was at a serious risk and didn't have a time to say, can I fight this guy? And he just went to what he was trained for. And that was his gun. And with a jury of six people, it looked like it carried the day beyond the reasonable doubt. But it's shocking to me. Mike, you brought up a great point about Curtis Reeves testifying. And Terry, I'm wondering what you think about that. Do you think that made all of the difference in this case? Because as Mike referenced, these police officers, and this was a guy who was a police officer for more than 20 years, they are trained to testify. And he's had since 2014 uh, to think a lot about this. Well, that's right. Usually it's not a good idea to take the stand. I agree with both of you, actually, because you're subject to cross-examination. But here we have someone who's trained to talk on the stand. And he had an opportunity here to explain his mindset, what was going through his mind. Why was he afraid that there might be death or serious bodily injury? So I think he explained himself very well. I, too, was shocked. But absolutely, the jury believed him. I think whether or not he got on that stand. Very interesting take from both of you. Curtis Reeves is a free man. He can do whatever he wishes uh, from now on. Now on to Kentucky, and that is where former Louisville Metro police officer Brett Hankison is, a, is expected, rather, to take the stand this week. He is facing charges in connection to the death of Breonna Taylor during the execution of a search warrant back in 2020. Now, Hankison is not charged with Taylor's death, but instead faces charges of wanton endangerment for firing shots shots through Taylor's apartment and into a unit neighboring hers. In March 2020, officers executed a no-knock warrant on Taylor's apartment. Her boyfriend, believing the officers were intruders, fired at them. The officers shot back and Taylor was killed in the crossfire. Last week, Taylor's sister and mother were both separately asked to leave the courtroom for wearing a shirt and a jacket depicting Taylor's face. While Taylor's sister was just asked to change her shirt, Taylor's mother was escorted out of the courthouse. Law & Crime Daily host Brian Buckmeyer sat down with Taylor's mother, who says she found the incident disrespectful but is more concerned with the court proceedings. For us, it's not about what's happening in the courtroom, it's more about what's not happening, right? 
nothing about this case has to do with what happened to Breonna Taylor. But although I would love that, I simply would much rather be able to sit in the courtroom instead of having to deal with this issue every day and watch people be escorted out. I think that um, it will come off as chaos and, and we don't want that either. You know, we want to be able to get through this and, and hopefully have a, a conviction for what little charge this is. On Monday, a hearing was held outside the presence of the jurors to discuss the other two officers involved in this case. If they are called to the stand, both officers plan to invoke their Fifth Amendment right to not testify and to not incriminate themselves. Court is expected to resume on Tuesday morning with more testimony. And just after disgraced real estate heir Robert Durst's murder conviction was vacated in the last several days, we are now hearing from the jurors who sat through his trial and found him guilty of murdering Susan Berman. Now, in September of last year, Durst was found guilty of that murder of Berman. The trial, which stretched on for months between 2020 and 2021, was followed closely by a panel of 23 people, 12 regular jurors and then 11 alternates. When Durst died, in January of this year, he was appealing the guilty verdict handed down by the jury. According to California state law, because an appeal was in the process at the time of Durst's death, the conviction must be vacated. Monday morning, we spoke with Carrie Antholis, host of the Jury Duty podcast, that he takes a deeper look at the jury who served on Durst's trial. He explained how two jurors, Carmen Kleketa and John Okanashi, feel about the vacated conviction. John was philosophical about it. Ultimately, Carmen, I think, was as well. But Carmen expressed substantially more regret that the court system uh, in California and in many other jurisdictions th essentially throws out a conviction if the, uh, if the case is pending appeal when a person dies. Um, I also spoke with John Lewin, the prosecutor, about it. And John also was pretty philosophical about it. Um, but he also indicated that there are arguments to make for allowing a, a, a conviction to stand once someone dies. Still ahead on Law and Crime Daily, a second day of evidentiary hearings begin as convicted killer Scott Peterson asks for a new trial in the death of his wife, Lacey, and their unborn son, Connor. But first, the disappearance of Harmony Montgomery. New details are released in a New Hampshire state investigation. We will have the very latest straight ahead. Hi, this is Dan Abrams with exciting news for all of our Law & Crime followers on YouTube. You can now get the live Law & Crime Network with YouTube TV for all of your daily live trial coverage, legal news, expert analysis, and original true crime programs. Subscribe to YouTube TV today and then locate Law & Crime in the channel guide. And for only $1.99 a month, you can add the network to your bundle. Watch Law & Crime every day with YouTube TV. We put you in the jury box. Welcome back. A report released by New Hampshire's governor found that there were missed opportunities to help a little girl named Harmony Montgomery, who hasn't been seen in more than two years. Harmony's father, Adam Montgomery, is in jail right now, accused of assaulting her by hitting her in the eye and giving her a black eye back in 2019. And it's apparent from this investigation that that black eye is included in this report about how Children's ha Services handled Harmony's case. Governor Chris Sununu released this update on the handling of Harmony Montgomery's case by New Hampshire's Department of Children, Youth and Families. An anonymous tip in July of 2019 led caseworkers to Harmony and her family. The report says after three home visits, it was determined that Harmony seemed happy and that the black eye occurred as the result of horseplay with a lightsaber. Harmony's father, Adam Montgomery, is now charged with giving Harmony that black eye. I think there's a lot that needs to be done at the state level in Massachusetts and New Hampshire, but also at the federal level. And, you know, right now our focus is trying to find harmony. 
Blair Miller is a Washington-based news correspondent. He and his husband adopted Harmony's younger brother, Jameson. He still very much thinks of Harmony in a very positive way. You know, he'll talk about her blonde hair, her blue eyes. He'll be at a park and think he sees her. He'll tell his teachers about her. Last week, Miller posted on Twitter a letter that he and his husband wrote to Adam Montgomery, pleading with him to share information with authorities about Harmony's whereabouts. This wasn't just a letter for Adam. This is a letter for everyone. You know, hopefully someone out there reads this. Maybe it's not Adam. Maybe it's someone else who reads this and says, I do know something. And I, this is bringing back a lot of thoughts and memories. Now, also recommended in the governor's update is a new interstate compact. That's an agreement between the state of New Hampshire and other states. He wants a new agreement drafted so that in the future, these cases are handled more carefully. There had been some type of home study uh, required for Harmony to be moved from the custody of her mother in Massachusetts to New Hampshire, but it was determined that that home study never occurred. So it's just a really sad, awful case. Mike and Terry, um, this is a case that's really bothered me as a mom. Terry, I know you're a mom too. Um, it's really sad and horrible to wonder about how a child could be missing for more than two years and nobody, nobody notices. So Terry, I'll start with you. Um, you know, it seems like a lot of people are pointing the finger at one another, all of these different adults, dad pointing the finger at mom, mom pointing the finger at dad. Uh, so, you know, is there a chance that nobody is ever held accountable for what happened to Harmony? I mean, sadly, Anjanette, it is a chance that that could possibly happen. I mean, Kayla, the stepmom, is saying she thought that Adam, the father, took the child back to her mother. Then the mother is saying she thought the child was with the father. And the father is saying, well, I took her back to her mother. So they are literally pointing fingers at each other. And I think that the entire system has failed this young child. And hopefully we will see charges beyond the welfare fraud and beyond other charges that don't relate to Harmony. Mike, this case really makes me wonder just how many children out there are falling through the cracks. I, I, I heaven forbid there's another Harmony Montgomery out there. So what kind of changes can New Hampshire and other states make? And, and can some federal legislation actually be drafted to prevent this type of thing in the future? Well, it's always easy to talk about theories and what could and should be done and things of that nature. I think one of the things that are most important is that you really have to start for these child protective services, things of that nature, with the training of those agents who work for those agencies, meaning that to make sure that their initial investigations are, are checked upon, followed up upon. It's very difficult for me to hear this as a criminal defense lawyer because I have seen just the opposite some, in many occasions where there are allegations that are not really that strong, that, that need some further investigation, yet they rush to conclusions. Here, it looks like this just totally fell off the radar, and it's very disturbing. So I think you've got to start from square one before you get to all the politics of it by just better training with the investigators. And let's hope uh, they find harmony sooner rather than later. We are all hoping the best for that little girl. Well, coming up on Law and Crime Daily, we move on to Ohio, where a former ICU doctor is accused of murdering 14 of his patients. He is on trial right now. Plus, nearly 20 years after the murder of his wife, Lacey, and unborn son, Connor, could Scott Peterson get a new trial? That's still ahead on Law and Crime Daily. Scott Peterson is back in a California courtroom as the second day of evidentiary hearings as he asks for a new trial get underway. On the stand, a juror from Peterson's first trial, she's been dubbed strawberry shortcake for many years, she's testifying about letters that she wrote to Scott Peterson after he went to prison. Now, Peterson's defense attorneys are arguing that he deserves a new trial based on juror misconduct. This stems from Juror 7 in Peterson's 2004 trial. Defense attorneys say Rochelle Neese did not disclose a past abusive relationship while she was pregnant. Neese, who took the stand on Friday and again Monday, was granted immunity in exchange for her testimony. Nearly 20 years ago, Neese was part of the jury that convicted Peterson in the deaths of his 27-year-old wife, Lacey, and their unborn son, Connor. 
During Monday's testimony, Neese said she exchanged letters with Peterson following the guilty verdict, where she referred to Peterson's unborn child as, quote, little man. She says Peterson maintained he did not kill his wife or child. Defense attorneys also read excerpts from the book titled We the Jury, co-authored by Neese and several other jurors after Peterson's conviction. Peterson was originally sentenced to death in the case, but was later resentenced to life in prison after the California Supreme Court said his death sentence should be overturned. Now, Terry, I'll start with you on this one. We've discussed this case many times. Uh, Peterson's death sentence, as I mentioned, had been based vacated. And now we're on to issues of jury selection and possible juror misconduct. This is really the only outstanding issue he has left to argue. So how do we improve the jury selection process to keep these types of things from happening again? Well, you know, obviously every defendant has a Sixth Amendment right to a jury of your peers. But here I think we need to have better voir dire. Obviously, lawyers can ask questions but we should really have more ramifications if those questions are not answered correctly. And those ramifications would be everything from contempt of court to paying fines to being in prison. And I also think we need more rules. You shouldn't be able to write a book and make money. I think that gives the wrong incentives to a jury. They should just go in to try to decide the case, period, end of story. And Mike, you know, she's known as Strawberry Shortcake. You saw the wild red hair she had during the trial. Uh, so that's why people call her that. It's not a derisive thing. But we know that this is, uh, she's really the big witness in this case. She's the star of the show. So uh, what could, Im what impact could other witnesses possibly have on the outcome? I, I really don't know if they could have much, but it's, it's funny when you said star of the show, because that's the <clears throat> problem here, getting back to what Terry said is, you shouldn't be allowed to publicize your jury duty. You should only be allowed to speak of it for educational purposes and things of that nature, but you shouldn't be allowed to profit from it. Interesting take from both of you. All right, uh, when we come back, we're gonna bring you up to speed on the case of a former ICU doctor in the state of Ohio accused of murdering his patients. His name is William Husel. And a fellow ICU doctor is called to the stand to testify against him as Husel is tried on 14 counts of murder. Welcome back, and we're going on to Ohio now, where a former ICU doctor is accused of murdering more than 14, or murdering 14 of his patients in the ICU where he worked. Now, so far, jurors have heard testimony in the case of Dr. William Husel from a nurse, a physician, and several pharmacists who worked at Mount Carmel Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. On Monday, prosecutors called Dr. Wes Ely, a professor of medicine at Vanderbilt University. He testified about specifics involving the drug fentanyl, including the impacts it can have and the safety of using that medication. He also told the jury the highest dosage of morphine he had ever given a patient was 200 micrograms. Prosecutors say Husel gave his patients 600 to 2,000 micrograms at a time. They say in and that in turn ended up killing them. The doctor was asked specifically about one patient receiving a dosage uh, of 1,000 micrograms of fentanyl before she died. It's, it's unclear from looking at these medical records how long she would live. She could live for days. She could live for maybe weeks. Uh, we don't know that. And when she was given the 1,000 micrograms of fentanyl, she only lived for eight minutes. And I think it's because her brain was completely shut off from delivering any more breathing by this what was it, what I deem a lethal dose of the medication. And I think it was unethical to give her a thousand micrograms of fentanyl when we did not know how long she, her natural life would, lit, would, would lead. And I think that we assured that she would not live by giving that dose, which to me is the cause of her death. Mike, uh, do you think the jury at this point is likely convinced, convinced that we know the cause of the death, but they just have to determine what was Husel's intent in administering th that amount of fentanyl or morphine? I, I think that's a very interesting question. It's going to be very interesting from the jury because this is a trial where they've got to go through two levels to decide where to go next. 
First, they've got to see in the profession, did he violate professional ethics? Then based on that, to decide if he violated the law. Very unusual, very interesting. Terry, if Husserl is convicted on the murder counts, that's a life sentence, 15 years to life. Do you think this will impact at all comfort care provided to patients in the U.S.? I absolutely think it's going to impact physicians. They're going to be thinking twice now about whether or not to offer comfort care. This isn't assisted suicide. We've seen those types of cases before. This is a physician who is looking at a patient who is near the end of their life, and they are thinking, you might be in pain. Remember, Dr. Husel had a patient, one of his first patients was in pain right before she died, and he saw her suffer. Since that time, at least according to the defense, he has been trying to give this comfort care to his patients as they are nearing death. If we see a conviction here, and it would be a conviction of murder, these physicians are going to think twice before offering comfort care. They're going to want someone to sign a form. They're going to not only follow these protocols that Mike is talking about, but they're going to be even more careful to make sure everybody is on board, making sure the pharmacist has seen what was needed as far as giving that care was concerned. So I think we're going to see people being far more stricter. Well, Mike Korobonix, thanks for being with us today. And Terry, thanks to you as always. And thank you for being with us. You've been watching Law and Crime Daily, and we'll see you next time as we continue to discuss justice in America.